Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to AI for Good. My name is Bastian Quast from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and I have the privilege of introducing today's session, AI in Weather and Climate, Doing Better, Doing Different, by Alberto Arrivas Herranz, Sustainability Lead for Microsoft Europe. It's part of the AI and Climate Science series, hosted by Professor Philip Steer and Dr. Duncan watson Paris of the University of Oxford. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and it's also the eighth organizer of AI for Good, together with ACM, XPRIZE, 38 UN sister agencies, and co-convened with Switzerland. For today's webinar, we'll be using the Q&A functionality for an active discussion. So please post any questions that you would like to ask to, to the speaker today there, and the questions will be asked by the uh, host of today's session, Philip and Duncan. Additionally, we have the chat functionality, which you can find on the right of your screen and that you can use to communicate with other participants. Please make sure to send your message to all panelists and attendees, and not just to the panelists. And with that, it's now time for me to hand it over to our host. Hi, Philip. How are you? Hello, and thank you very much. Um, so one of the aims of the series is to bring people from academia and industry uh, together to accelerate climate science with AI. It's really hard to imagine anyone incorporating this uh, better in a single person than today's speaker, Alberto Arribas Herranz. So Alberto has a PhD in climate modeling uh, from Spain, uh, and then also a diploma in strategy and innovation from Oxford. But he has a really long career at the Met Office, managing seasonal forecasting, and then as head of the informatics lab, when he then already moved into the areas of AI and ML. After a short stint at the University uh, of Exeter as an associate professor, he's now the sustainability science lead for Europe at Microsoft. And today's talk from Alberto will be about AI and weather and climate, doing better, doing different. And I like the title series here, emerging from the speaking series. Alberto, over to you. We're very much looking forward to your talk. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, Philip. And it's a it's a real pleasure to be to be here and to to get to see you again. It has been it has been some time since the last time that we could we could see each other. And thank you very much to to everybody for the invitation to be here in this in this presentation today, and and for everybody to to make a space in in your days to to attend this talk. So let me try to share my screen so we can see the presentation. Hopefully, hopefully everybody can see my slides now. I see I see a note from, from Philip, so I think I think we are we are ready to go. So, so as I say, it's a real pleasure to be here. And, and as Philip was saying, this is a a long term interest of of mine. How to mix all of the research that we do in weather and climate with the new technologies. And and the point of this talk today, and, and the reason that I thought it was great to have the opportunity to talk here, is that. These, these new technologies, these emerging kind of technologies give us the opportunity not only to try to do the same things that we were doing before better, but also to do things that perhaps were very difficult to do before. And, and now we have an opportunity to, to try to, to tackle. So I just wanted to start by putting this a little bit into context. And I'm, I'm sure that none of you needs to be reminded of this, but of course, climate is, is kind of top of mind now for, for everybody. And these are some, some recent, kind of front pages in, in some kind of journals and, and magazines and, and rightly so because climate is definitely one of the, the biggest kind of challenges that we have to, to address. And, and I have mentioned here in the top right hand corner, we need to try to address this in a, in a short period of time. So we barely have 30 years to try to achieve the, the goal of, of keeping the temperatures at, at 1.5 or, or, or even if we can kind of lower lower than that. But it's the magnitude of this challenge as well that it is bringing kind of everybody now into this problem that perhaps were not not being involved before. And, and these couple of graphs that I have put here on the on the bottom right that, that are coming from a recent article in The Economist gives you an, an idea of how much interest and how much capital is flowing now into this, this problem in terms of venture capital. And you can see that in a relatively short space of time in, in barely kind of 15 years, we have gone from essentially having very little investment in, in energy transition, for example, to having around 500 billion per year in this, in this space. And, and as you can see in the other graph, quite a lot of the investment actually from venture capital is going into enabling technology to solve the, the, climate, the climate issue and the climate challenge. 
know this is the situation, but I wanted to put it a little bit more in, in the context of the, the history and, and the progress that we have seen in, in weather and climate. And I wanted to do that by using this, this type of curve, which is, is kind of known as, a, as an S curve in, in kind of in, in business and, and a strategy, but essentially it's a way of plotting what is the, the time or the effort that you need to put into something against kind of the revenue or the growth of the improvement that you are going to get in that, in that particular industry. And I think it's quite useful actually to map the, the history of the progress in numerical weather prediction and, and climate prediction against this type of curve, because it, it allows you to see some things that I, I believe are quite, quite useful. So what you can see is from the beginning of the 20th century, 1900s and, and until the mid of the century, 1950s, really what we did was to learn to, to kind of represent the partial differential equations, the Napier stoke and so on, and to solve them in, in a computer at the same time that we were developing the computers. And I have mentioned here or included here this seminal paper by Charney and, and von Neumann on, on the integration of the barotropic equation. And this is pretty much kind of the starting point on this kind of long-term relationship between the progress in computing and the progress in, in weather prediction. And, and by the 1960s, we had kind of reached a point in which this, this was the standard, the dominant design. So we, we learned how to solve these partial differential equations on a, on a high-performance computer. And what we did then is to spend the next kind of 60 years really improving this, just having incremental improvements and, and bringing a lot of clever people doing a lot of really difficult stuff from data simulation to medical modeling to post-processing to really make the, the progress that we have seen, this phenomenal progress in weather prediction and, and climate take place. What has happened is essentially that we have focused in, in two dimensions, and this is a simplification, but it's a, I think it's a, a useful simplification, and I'm, I'm borrowing a slide from, from a good friend, from Brian Lawrence, from NCAS and, and University of Reading here in the UK. What we have done mainly is to, to improve in two, in two dimensions, the, the resolution of the simulations, the spatial temporal resolution of the simulations, and also adding more complexity in the, in the simulations. And in the case of weather, preference have been given to the resolution because we want to be able to solve as many processes as, as possible in what is essentially an initial value problem, whereas in climate, the, the preference has been given to the complexity because we need to solve things like the carbon cycle, because we need to be able to integrate the simulations in a long, long period of time to address issues like, like climate and what is going to be the, the impact of, of increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the, in the atmosphere. And of course, at the same time, we try to do as many simulations as possible to try to capture the uncertainties and, and get a handle in, in over these, these uncertainties. But once we have done this, essentially what has happened more recently is we, we have hit this end of more slow. And I have put the, the end of more slow in, in inverted quote, uh, commas because it tends to trigger quite a, a strong reaction from, from people that, that essentially go into the the whole kind of discussion of whether it is the end or not at the end or, or being more precise about whether it is more slow or, or then at a scaling or, or other, other related issues. But the, the point that I want to communicate with this is whereas not that long ago you could wait and next year you will be able to buy a cheaper computer that will be more powerful than the one that you could buy today. That's, that's no longer the case. So it's, it's now much more difficult to create faster processors. And what that means is that we are dealing with this by increasing the number of processors. And that, that brings other challenges. And it's not only that increase kind of the amount of effort and, and expenditure that you need to make with the, the supercomputers, but also means that we have to rewrite our models, we have to recode them, we have to change the way we do things. That also has a cost in terms of the, the amount of people that you need to devote to, to solve these problems. And, and therefore it, it brings essentially diminishing returns from the kind of the, the traditional kind of way of doing things. And what we have seen in terms of this phenomenal improvement between the 1960s and, and the early uh, 2010s and, and so on. At the same time, what we are seeing now is the emergence of new technologies. So we see machine learning, we see cloud compute, and, and this is very, very important because what it's telling us is that we can also start looking at these new technologies to address some of these issues that we, we need to, to address. Oops. Of course, the, the situation that we are, are in now, in which we have some technologies that are, if you want, kind of tailing off or, or reaching kind of a, an asymptote in terms of the, the progress of the, the return that they give us, 
and these kind of new technologies just produce a, an area an area of fermentation an area in which we have to combine all of these all of these different things and really learn how to do things in a in a different way one thing that i want to highlight is what i point out at the, the other side of this graph which the last period of fermentation really took around 50 years so we we should expect that these periods of fermentation can take a long time. We shouldn't expect that tomorrow we have learned everything that we need to learn and we are going to be using everything extremely efficiently and, and beautifully. There is a period of learning here and that's the situation in which we are. We really are in the middle of a, of a learning curve. But this is really, really exciting. And this would be my message actually to all of the young people that is starting now in this domain. This is the most exciting period really from, from the 1950s. Now is the opportunity really to to bring new knowledge and to be able to do things in a, in a different way. Recently, there was a presentation also in this series by Veronica Eyring and Pierre Gentine, in, in which the, the title was Better, Better Machine Learning for Improved Climate Models and Projections. And I, I thought it was a fantastic presentation and I really encourage people to, to look at it. And because they covered quite a lot of the areas inside the, the models themselves and how to improve these models and, and projections. I thought that I could I could talk about something related but slightly different, which is what the kind of things that we perhaps can do now that we couldn't do before. And I think it's useful to, to look at these simplifications that I'm making in this slide in terms of using these emerging technologies to do the same things that we could do better than we could do before, but to do them better. And an example is the paper that I mentioned here on the left-hand side, in, in which there is a use of neural nets to emulate uh, a parameterization. And this is great and it's extremely useful. And this paper that I mentioned is a, is a good paper and I like it, but this is essentially just trying to essentially search for, for an efficiency, for an improvement on something that we, we could do. At the same time, we can also look at this in a very different way and, and say, okay, what it is that we can do now that we couldn't do before? And I think it matters to be aware in which space you are, whether you are trying to do the same thing better or whether you are trying to do something that you couldn't do before, because they are very different. So one is focusing on the efficiency and, and it's going to have a lot of internal capabilities and, and formal structures and roles. So every national med service will have a parameterization section, for, for example. Whereas if you are looking at things that you couldn't do before, you are going to have to rely on partners. You are going to have to create a group of people outside your own organization to allow you to do this. And it's going to have a, a looser kind of a structure and, and roles. And therefore it's, it's important that we, we know this. And keeping that in mind, there are three areas that I, I wanted to talk about. So the first one is about how we can make the data that we produce from these models more, more useful. And I'm going to be presenting examples from, from Pangeo and the Microsoft Planetary Computer. And also I'm going to be talking about two recent papers that I am a, a co-author. The first one is about dealing with convective scale resolution and the other one about improving understanding in terms of the, the processes that we need to, to learn with. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to pause a second because I have one of my kids that I don't know what is happening to him, but he's, he's calling me. So please bear with me just, just one second. No worries at all, Alberto. It's modern life. So just stay tuned while Alberto does some uh, active parenting on his presentation, and I'm sure he will be back in just a minute. Okay, apologies. Apologies about that. Crisis, crisis averted, or at least at least contained until until a few a few minutes. No worries. 
<laughs> so since I'm going to be talking about these three areas, and I, I will start with the first one in terms of things or, or kind of approaches that we can take to make the data, the beautiful data that we generate from, from weather and climate more, more useful. And the main reason for, for doing that is again that the volumes of data that is coming out of our disciplines are, are huge. So we we are now well into kind of petaflops and, and quite a lot of the institutes. This this particular diagram is for N, from N, is for NCAR and it's a slide from, from Brian Lawrence. But this is very similar for any other organization, whether you look at ECNWF or, or you look at the Met Office or, or you look at Meteo France. So the, the volumes of data are huge. And what this means is we need to look at different ways of dealing with this data. And I wanted to highlight this, this project and, and this community, Pangeo. And this is a, a project that I started in my, in my former group, the group that I lead in the, the informatics lab. And the slides that I'm going to show are coming from Ryan Abernathy and, and Chele Gentleman that has, has been doing a lot of work within, within this, this community. And this is a quick illustration of what the problem is. So traditionally, our community have worked under the paradigm that you take data and, and this data is in a particular database and you download it. And then once you have downloaded, you, you do a particular computation with this data. And that was okay when you were dealing with megabytes. It was, it was possible to survive when you were dealing with gigabytes. It got very, very difficult when you are dealing with terabytes. And essentially, it's impossible when you are dealing with petabytes of data, as, as we are dealing with now. And this is where Pangeo come into place. And you have to think of Pangeo first and, and foremost as a community, as a global community that involves a huge number of organizations, many of which are, are listed here in this, in this slide. And then as a, as a software ecosystem that is essentially creating the links between many open software projects that, that already exist and making easy that these pieces of software kind of speak to each other to do things that otherwise are, are difficult. And here is where Microsoft come into place because Microsoft essentially has, has built upon this Pangeo ecosystem and, and Pangeo community to create a, a planetary computer. And what the planetary computer does is essentially to put together all of the infrastructure to generate, to access, to use environmental data more easily. And I have listed here some of the data sets that are already easily accessible and, and easy to manipulate inside the planetary computer. And this includes data from, from remote sensing, like Sentinel or Landsat, and data from weather and climate, whether it is CMIP6 or reanalysis like ERA5 or forecast from, from GFS but also biodiversity data and, and land cover data. And there are two things that I wanted to highlight. The, the first is that this really enables you to have kind of an scalable and interoperable, interoperable kind of ability to mix the data sets and even to bring other data sets into the mix. And this, this point is fundamental. The fact that this is built on open software and open architecture is the critical element to facilitate that interoperability. And in fact, you can take and run the planetary computer anywhere. And, and this is what is being done currently at the Digital Earth Pacific, where many nations in the Pacific are now creating a, an implementation of this for, for their own purposes. And the second thing that I wanted to highlight is how much easier this makes the whole kind of manipulation and processing of, of data to make the data more, more useful because you can essentially start doing complicated things like distributed processing without having to know what distributed processing is. And, and by using APIs and front ends like JupyterLab, that simply means that you just need a browser and an internet connection and you can start coding against this complex data set. You can start creating partner applications. And, and I wanted to show some of those partner applications because the planetary computer has a kind of a a sister program, which we call AI for Earth, that essentially provide grants and, and experts. So you can not only access the data and the compute facilities, but you have access to this expertise and, and funding. And this has created more than 800 projects now in over 100 countries. And, and these are some of the things that have come out of these projects, like global land use and classification applications, deforestation risk analysis, ecosystem monitoring, conservation planning. And I really invite people to go and, and take a look at them because they are really, really impressive. In fact, I, I want to show one of them with you. And this is a, a new application that is coming from the UN Biodiversity Lab that has kind of created 
uh, or has demonstrated how to really make use of all of these data sets in, in, in a particular way and, and building it on, on top of the planetary computer. So let me let me play this video for you. From the streets of New York City to the heart of the Amazon, maps help us understand how our changing planet is affecting our lives. Maps help us see where nature is thriving and where it is being destroyed. Spatial data help decision makers put nature at the heart of sustainable development by helping them identify essential ecosystems that help us secure water, feed more than 7 billion people, avoid natural disasters, keep carbon in the ground, and sustain more than 2 billion livelihoods. We at the United Nations, together with our partners, are excited to launch the next iteration of the UN Biodiversity Lab. We have updated the UN Biodiversity Lab with new data and new functions to help decision makers put nature at the heart of development. To access more than 400 cutting edge global data sets, including the world's first 10 meter resolution land cover and land use map. To explore popular data collections that unlock the power of data on key thematic issues and that provide insights on how and where action is needed most. To create a secure workspace where you can upload your own data, generate your own insights on the intersection of nature, climate, and sustainable development. To calculate dynamic indicators such as deforestation, showing the state of the planet at the click of a button. To generate your own powerful maps, that can guide local and national action for nature, climate, and sustainable development. Powered by Microsoft's planetary computer and supported by more than 30 data providers, the UN Biodiversity Lab provides novel insight that is essential for putting nature at the heart of sustainable development. Our goal is to enable everyone to harness the power of data, to equip policymakers with powerful tools to make more informed decisions on nature, and to be able to monitor the pulse of our planet. Join us. Start exploring today at unbiodiversitylab.org. So I hope that you have, you have enjoyed that. I think it's a, a great application, actually, and a great demonstration of, of the point that I was making on, on the ability to combine data sets and to facilitate the use of these data set to create value and, and facilitate decision making. And I wanted to, to go a bit deeper into one of the, the kind of examples of data sets that I've mentioned in the video, which is this kind of 10 meter land cover data set, which was created by, by Impact Observatory among many partners. And, and I think it's useful to look at the way this happened and, and what's the value of platforms like the planetary computer to enable this to happen because Impact Observatory trained a neural network model. And the reason that they were able to train this, this neural network was because the National Geographic Lab had been working with humans, humans like you and me, to be able to have a kind of a, a human label labeled pixels on and more than five billion of these kind of human labeled pixels in which people had gone to, to images and identified kind of a forest or a lake or, or something else. And then by having those data sets, you will train the neural net. And once the neural net had been trained, you can apply it and, and kind of scale it up. And in this case, you could scale it up using kind of satellite observation from Sentinel from the European Space Agency. And this, this is a great demonstration of how these new technologies and AI and cloud compute enable the creation of these partnerships between different people that you can apply things that already exist to create things that were otherwise very, very difficult and, and simply impossible, like this, this 10 meter global land cover data set. Now I want to move to, a, to another problem. And, and I think it's a really interesting problem for our domain, which is the, the dealing with convective scale resolutions. And the reason that this is extremely important is, is well known, but I think this, this recent paper does, does a very good job actually of, of exposing the problem. And, and as they say, or, or as they find in this, this problem, what they saw is by going to high resolution, and, and in this case, they test different kind of high resolution models for, for climate, some at around 10 kilometers, some at around three kilometers. And even at 10 kilometers, they saw that there is a, a reduction of the biases of around 40%, but 
the, the biases gets much, much smaller when you just go at three kilometers for things like the hourly precipitation, the heavy hourly precipitation, which is the kind of thing that we are really worried for, for climate change. So what this tells us is that increasing the horizontal resolution and of course, running multiple simulations is really, really important to be able to capture what is going to be the, the impact of, of climate change at, at the local level. But of course, both things, increasing the horizontal resolution and running multiple simulations is, is very expensive. So can we use machine learning to help us in this, in this space? And the answer is that we can, and, and this paper is, is a paper that I'm one of the co-authors, and it's a, it's a paper that recently appeared in Nature, in which we use a, a deep generative model to do a skillful precipitation of, of high resolution precipitation. In, in this case, it's trying to do now casting, that's precipitation for the next couple of hours, and, and the input into the system is, is radar images. And this is a challenge, not only from the weather forecasting point of view, this is also a challenge from the machine learning point of view. And I, I love this, this image that some of the colleagues put together in which it gives an idea of the size of the image that we need to try to create kind of a forecast in the future for the, for the radar and the kind of image that is traditionally used from, from data sets like ImageNet. I should say that this is a, a work that was done in collaboration with colleagues and friends from DeepMind and, and the Met Office. And what we do here is essentially to, to create a deep generative model. Essentially, this is a statistical model that is going to learn the probability distribution of data, and then it's going to generate samples from this, from this distribution. And it's, it's a probabilistic model. Therefore, you can generate an ensemble. You can generate many realizations of what the future is going to be while preserving the spatiotemporal properties of, of the field that you are trying to, to forecast. And, and the approach that we follow is essentially that of a generative adversarial network. And, and this is really very interesting because it's the same kind of approach that have been used to do things like kind of deep fake videos and, and so on. And in which what you have is two kind of uh, networks that are competing against each other. So one, the generator is trying to create kind of a synthetic image that look as realistic as possible. And then you have a discriminator that is trying to detect what is real and, and what is not. So in this case, for the generator, we provide some previous images of the radar, the, the previous 20 minutes, and then the discriminators are trying to separate. And, and as it's shown in this, this diagram, and there is much more information in the paper, you try to separate it, ensuring that you keep the temporal consistency, but also that you're going to avoid blurriness. You can keep the intensity of the precipitation where the intensity needs to be. And also you have a kind of a regularization that you just improve kind of the, the local accuracy. But to cut a long story short, it works and it works extremely well. And what this uh, figure shows is an example for a particular kind of challenging event that, that happened on the east coast of, of Scotland in 2019. And on the right hand side of the, the diagram, what you have is the, the observations in the top row. Then you have the deep generative model in the second row, the one that I have highlighted with the red rectangle. Then you have the traditional kind of approach of doing no casting, which essentially is based in, in abduction, and then another kind of competing method from, from machine learning. And what you can see is that the method is doing a very good job of capturing where the intensity of the precipitation needs to be. And, and if you compare it with the traditional models, the one that is labeled by a step, by a step you have too intense rain that is just move along, is not kept in the place that it stays in the observations. And in the case in the other model in the bottom of the, of the figure, what you see is that everything has been diffused. And it has been diffused because the, the, the model in that case, that particular neural net is, is learning that it gets a better score if just diffuse the forecast. But that's of course not, not very useful. And I will be talking a little bit about that in a, in a second. I wanted to issue a, a warning here, which is essentially the, the way machine learning has progressed and, and machine learning has done an amazing job of just kind of solving a lot of really hard problems is by, by what I call the, the tyranny of the leaderboard, which is just to be in very strict and just say, okay, I have, I have this particular metric that I need to, to kind of address or improve and, and hit this particular thing that I need to, to minimize. 
and, and I'm just going to train my machine learning to do better and better against that, that particular metric. But when you are working in a, in a space like weather forecasting or climate prediction, that is a kind of very multidimensional kind of problem, a single metric is never going to be, to be enough. And, and here is an example in the top column is the critical success in this for, for different kind of prediction intervals and different precipitation threshold to, to the kind of right hand side where you have kind of the, the highest precipitation threshold for eight millimeters an hour. And it's very difficult if you were to look only at this at this particular metric. It's very difficult to distinguish which particular model is is doing best. So you need to look at more things. And, and if you look in detail, you find that the model that we put together, the deep generative model, was doing at least as as well as as any other model. But you need to look at more more variables. And this is what we did in this paper. And I think this paper is very valuable because the basket of metrics that we analyzed was, was very wide. But you also need to remember to check that you are really doing what you were intending to do. And this is why I, I think that the second row in this plot is very, very, very important, which is essentially just looking at the power spectral density and then checking that actually the solutions that you are getting from this model really keep the high kind of spatial resolution that you need to keep. And if you look in particular to the central panel in the in the bottom row, the one for the T plus 90, you can see that only the deep generative model is keeping a resolution that is equivalent to one kilometer, where the other models actually have a, an effective resolution that is more like 30 kilometers. So, so in effect, even if they are looking good from, from one particular index, they are not doing what, what you want them to do. And you are losing this, this ability to do kind of forecast at high resolution and to capture the, the convective events. And it's very important when you are looking at things like convection and, and convection matters, because this is really kind of the, the spatial scale that we are now. In many ways, we have solved the problem of the synoptic scales. We are now in this very, very difficult area of convection in which is a, is a purely chaotic regime or, or is a chaotic regime to a, to a large extent. You really need to check the, the decision-making value of these, of these models. And the top row here, so it for the kind of the economic value analysis. And, and what you can see, the, the thing that you're looking for there is to have a peak as high as possible and as much kind of area under the curve as possible. And again, the deep generative model is doing better than, than any, other, any other model. And the bottom column is again, really, really interesting because it's, it's where we brought the expert evaluation. So what we decided was this is not enough just to do a series of, of metrics, a basket of scores. We also need to test this against the real experts that are going to be using it in the real world. Because at the end of the day, this is where the, the value of these simulations is. So we put together a group of, of 50 forecasters from the Met Office, and these are the professionals from the operation center that are doing this every single day for extreme precipitation events for all kinds of sectors, whether it is aviation or sport events or, or any other thing. And we put them uh, through a test in which they have to look at different outputs from these models and, and check which one they thought that it was kind of providing a more useful guidance for, for these particular problems. And as you can see in the graph, in, in most cases over, over kind of 80, over 90% of the, of the meteorologists, we're choosing this deep generative model as the, as the best solution. So as you can see from both, a kind of a, a purely kind of quantitative metric score and a qualitative score from the expert, this was showing that machine learning artificial intelligence applications can really do a very good job at convective scales. And this, this gives us hope actually in this space that is, is a very complicated space. And finally, I wanted to talk about the, the, the role that machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and these emerging technologies can play in helping us to improve our understanding. And at the end of the day, this is very, very important because as Philip was saying in the introduction, we really want to use this to, to establish bridges between academia and industry. And, and really we need to improve our understanding in these challenging areas. So I want to present briefly the results for another recent paper, which is quantifying causal pathways of teleconnections that has recently been accepted at, at BAMS. And this is work that we did in collaboration with colleagues from, from the University of Reading and, and the Met Office. And it was focusing on the teleconnections because teleconnections are critical because they are the, the 
processes that are giving us kind of predictability for, for many kind of regional climate processes. But very often we, we still don't know very well what is kind of the, the contribution of different processes to these teleconnections. And, and this is a very difficult thing to, to disentangle. So we, we wanted to use causal frameworks here as an approach to connect the physical knowledge and the statistics, because as was highlighted recently by Ted Sepper, much of the uncertainty that we face in, in climate predictions actually is associated with teleconnections. So by improving our knowledge of teleconnections, same as, as by improving our ability to represent convection, we can improve our knowledge and our understanding of what the design and what is going to be the impact of, of climate change at local or regional level in, in the coming years. In many ways, what we are trying to do here is to disentangle the causality of situations like the ones are described in these two figures. And, and the first one is the impact of the North Atlantic Oscillation on the precipitation over kind of Northern Europe in, in Denmark and, and the Mediterranean. And the second one is the impact that changes in, in ENSO are going to have over the precipitation in, in California. And for many people in the community, this will look very obvious because these are processes that are, are well understood, but we were choosing these processes precisely because they are understood, because they allow us to essentially show how a causal framework can work in these, in these spaces. Also because then you are going to have situations that are much more complicated, like this one in which you start to disentangle to try and try to disentangle what is the role of things like the sea ice in, in the Kara Sea with the stratospheric polar vortex and the role that is going to have and how it's going to be mediated by ENSO and the modern Julian oscillation via the, the kind of the changes in, in sea level pressure in the North Pacific. And, and this can get very, very complicated. But again, this paper, what it does is walking through these different examples, provide a, a way of, of demonstrating how you can apply these causal frameworks into these situations with the teleconnections. And this is a very active area of research. So this is a, a slide from Gustav Campbell's, who is an extremely active and, and fantastic researcher in this, in this area, illustrating some of the recent papers and, and work that is happening in this, in this space. And, and as I say, it's a very, very active area of, of research and a really interesting area of research. But in a nutshell, what you try to do in, in causal uh, inference is to try to demonstrate what is the influence that a particular process X is going to have in another process Y. And, and the way you do that is by trying to demonstrate that if you make an intervention in, in the process X, while you keep everything else fixed, how do you change the probability, probability distribution of Y? And Judah Pearl is, is no doubt kind of a seminal figure in, in all of this. And, and he has published a few books and, and papers that I definitely recommend everybody to, to read if you have the time there. They are great introductions into, into this space. As a kind of graphical kind of illustration of this, you can, you can think of this in a very simple way. And I put two examples of this in, in the center of the image here. The one on the left with what is called normally a fork we do have a, a, a common cause that is producing an, an impact on two, on two different events. So as, as it is illustrated here, so Z is having an influence in Y and, and in X, which is a typical situation like the one described in this first example on the North Atlantic Oscillation influencing both the precipitation over Denmark and the precipitation over the Mediterranean. Or you can have chains in which you're going to have one event influencing another that then influences a third one, which is a very similar situation to what you have in the case of ENSO, influencing the, the North Pacific jet stream, which then has an impact on the, on the winter precipitation in, in California. What you try to do in causal inference then is to, if you want, block the information, block the information in set to say, okay, once I block that information, can I see whether the precipitation on Denmark has an influence on the precipitation in the Mediterranean, or once I block the, in this case, the, the jet stream, can I demonstrate then that ENSO has a direct influence over the, the precipitation in, in California? The beauty of this is that once you are able to write your, your kind of diagram, your hypothesis of what is the causality relationship between these things, then you can follow a series of steps to try to prove whether you are right or not. So you start by setting up this kind of diagram of what is the causal 
kind of chain of, of events that you are trying to, to see. And the second step is you collect the time series, the data of all of the processes that are involved, all of the variables involved there. And then you can start testing the implications of, of one variable on another by doing this kind of blocking of information in different diagrams. And this is what it does in this, in this paper, just to do an illustration of how this can be a very useful framework to kind of quantify and articulate what we mean by teleconnections. And, and it has these two steps. And I think this is the beauty of, of what we present in this paper, that first of all, you write your hypothesis and then you can follow a, a series of simple rules to evaluate and, and using observations, you can check and evaluate what is the effect that one variable has, has in another. I really want to highlight what I say here in the final bit of the slide, that these causal approaches is, is not something that we are presenting as competing with model experiments. It's a way of complementing model experiments. There is no reason to see these things in opposition. They are essentially just working in the same direction to help us as scientists build our, our scientific intuition into the statistical analysis of, of data. And this is everything I wanted to, to say today. I, I just wanted to bring back or come back to this point that really we are in a period of fermentation, a period of experimentation, a period of learning about just how to use all of these kind of new kind of technologies that we have at our disposal now. And this is the beauty of it because it allows us not only to do better what we were doing before, but also to try to do things that we couldn't do before, or at least to try to do things that we couldn't do before in an easier or, or better way that, that we could. And I, I hope that you have enjoyed the three examples that we have presented here in terms of making the data more useful or dealing with convection or, or improving understanding. And, and I have mentioned the papers here, so you can, you can go and, and look at them in more, in more detail. And that's everything from me today. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alberto. That was a really, really great talk and a great overview. Um, so, so we can dig right into a question. Just for the audience, if you put your questions in the Q&A, it's easier to pick them up than in the chat. Um, but Duncan, do you want to lead off on the questions? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think actually this question did actually pop up in the in the chat uh, while you were presenting um, your the, the planetary computer video. Um, so uh, I can't see that. Oh, Mohit uh, Dubi asks if the platform itself is open source or, or and or available to the public, and and I guess what the licensing conditions are to, to you know using this fantastic resource. Yeah, the platform is is open to the to the public, so you can you can go to the the web address that was put there in the slides, and is is freely open and, and available to to everybody. And and you can. When, what's the, are there any limitations to creating your work, your own workspace? I don't know. I just feel slightly, you know, I, I feel dubious when people say stuff is free. You know, I kind of wonder what <laughs> <laughs> what's the catch. So, so the, the, the platform is there is there to to use. So essentially, you can access the, the data and so on. So then, in many cases, and, and this is the eight hundred projects that I was mentioning, we we provide grants to facilitate and, and give kind of access to expert and compute resources. If you go for the sake of argument and you just start using it as a personal or private organization and, and using compute resources, so you pay for the compute resource. So in that case, right. it's, it's pay as you go if you are using compute resources, but you can also access these grants if you are using it for other purposes of research and, and so on. So I, I would definitely encourage people to go and visit it and, and definitely if that triggers ideas and projects that you want to go just to apply for some of the grants because that has been that has been absolutely fantastic work done through these grants. Fantastic. No, that's great. Yeah. And maybe um, if you get a chance, you can put put a link in, in the chat or um, I guess it will be in your slides. At, at, at yeah, I will put I will put the link in a moment. Um, just while you're doing that, I'm curious, because you mentioned this in the context of Pangeo as well, and I know you're intimately involved in, in setting that up. Uh, are some of the you know, learnings from scaling these projects out feeding back into Pangeo and back into the open source community? Yeah, and I think, I think that's one of the, the beauties of this. So, so what we are doing now at Microsoft is contributing very actively to all of these kind of open source communities. So essentially you just continue empowering the communities at the same time that you can create if you want versions that are more consolidated like the planetary computer using this technology. So there is a continuous dialogue in there. And, and that means that the planetary computer really 
can be taken and then installed in another place if you want and, and use it. And, and in that sense, that's, that's one of the great benefits of this, just to really facilitate in that interoperability of, of data sets, because different people will need to work in different ways for, for different reasons. And, and is that flexibility, that, that ability to scale and, and interoperate that I think is the, the thing that we really need now to be able to kind of unlock and tackle some of the challenges that we face? Yeah, absolutely. Thank There's you. a related question in the Q&A a little bit that follows up directly from it. It's about the big data in a way. With increasing cost of, of, of moving data, um, what, what will this mean if you continue to grow exponentially? Will it mean then ultimately that the data just stays in a few potentially commercial repositories or, or how, how do we see the future of data evolving? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, it's, it's this very often used phrase of just don't move the data, move the algorithm, because the algorithm is is kind of lighter. But but yeah, no doubt. And, and we are seeing this in all kinds of domains, in the commercial domain and also in the research domain, in which you see a consolidation of, of the data center simply because it's, it's easier to do things that way and, and provide you the scalability. But at the same time, you need to ensure that you are able to interoperate things. For, for the sake of argument, you may have a, a data set or a data center just run by a UK research organization, and you may need to essentially link and do operations also in, in Azure, in, in the Microsoft Cloud, because you happen to be an insurance company that runs your operations there. So I think the trick here is how do you facilitate that kind of interoperability of the algorithms without having to say, look, now you have to move hundred petabytes of data from one data center to another because that takes time and costs money and, and essentially it's difficult and and this is the thing we we really want to minimize the amount of time the amount of time that a physicist for example uh, has to spend dealing with the data wrangling issues and, and maximize the amount of that physicist can expend actually just thinking and, and doing the, the hard work of trying to solve problems but yeah the the, the data engineering side of things is something that we have to be very conscious. And that's why I was talking about Geo and the planetary computer, because if you want to enable machine learning, data engineering is a critical element here. And, and you really have to facilitate that that kind of data flow is easy. If, if you don't put the effort into making the data flows and the engineering and the technology to serve the purpose of science, what you end is having a lot of, a lot of scientists just spending a lot of time just moving data and, and doing kind of suboptimal solutions. So that's, that's for me, the, the thing that we really need to, to eliminate, just really facilitate that if you're a biologist or you're a physicist or you are any other domain of, of knowledge, you can spend as much time as possible just solving problems and making sure that then those problems help people as opposed to just fighting data. Certainly sounds appealing to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, maybe the next question, actually, also from, from Michael. Um, how can we protect, so this, this touches on the, the causal inference work that you presented last, um, and he asks how we can protect against the equivalent of p-hacking in causal modelling. So when a complex phenomenon such as ENSO is boiled down to a single variable, how do you make sure it's not synthesised in such a way to tell a compelling causal story? So I guess you have many many possible teleconnections. So how do you, how do you ensure <clears throat> Yeah, so I, th I think one of the very interesting things with this is, okay, so first of all, you have to bring the expert knowledge in terms of what, what is the causal network that you are trying to describe. And, and don't get me wrong, there are difficulties here. So this is not designed to try to represent the full climate system. It, it, that's not the point. The point is to already use your expert knowledge to kind of abstract the problem and, and make choices in there. And, and then once you have made those choices, you can start testing them. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. You can test them systematically and, and check whether that causal network actually is representative of what you are trying to do or not. And if it is not, you go back to the drawing board and, and start just thinking again. And I find that very powerful and very compelling, but, but yeah, it's difficult as well. So there are things like the climate system, of course, the, the things in the past also influence the things in the future and, and the present. So the whole kind of recurrence of some process and so on is difficult to incorporate here. But yeah, it's a very active research and a really, really interesting area of research. Thank you. Great. There's a question by, by Christoph Koller, who, who asked basically about the confidence you have into, into human labels in the impact observatory data set. 
So, so was it a single human label vote per image or multiple labelers? And is this incorporated into training? And again, it's basically, could this be human biased uh, <laughs> training data? So it's, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved in that particular piece of work myself. So I'm, I'm not sure actually how, how the quality control was, was done and whether you were essentially just waiting for five people to be able to label the same pixel before you were trusting it or, or not. But, but yeah, this is the kind of questions that actually are worth asking every time that you go into one of these problems. So how, how are you going to do the quality control before you scale up? And even when you scale up, how do you use the community as well? to check this because this is the other way of playing the game. So you could scale up and at the same time, just put it out there and say, okay, just flag when you are seeing things that are not making any, any sense. So if I remember correctly, the statistics were that the, the, the confidence with the 85% kind of confidence in terms of the labels that were coming out of the full system once it was being scaled with all of the images from, from Sentinel and so on, but yeah, it would be it would be good, and I, I must admit I, I don't know the details exactly of how the labeling of those of those images was done. No problem. This is slightly cheek, cheeky question, and and I'll put it to you, but you don't need to. We we certainly don't want to get into a corporate uh, 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 wrestling uh, game in this in this event series, but but. The question is, is, is the planetary computer similar to other choices from other companies like Earth Engine? And, 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 but basically, what distinguishes it? it or, but, or maybe we can broaden the question, how do we ultimately, with multiple tools coming up, how do we move forward with a duplicating resource and, and, and making it most useful for climate science in the end? So I, think, I think the planetary computer in that sense is quite unique from the point of view that it is, is fully built. From, from kind of open software. And, and that makes it essentially this, this kind of portable and, and fully interoperable system. And I think that's a huge strength in that, in that sense. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is always going to be a variety of systems and people is going to follow different approaches. But for us, it was very important actually to support this open software community and, and to be able to support the community itself. So then you could have the full choice from you can take the software and run it if you want in your own state in whatever way you want, or you can choose to go to the planetary computer and have things made more easy for you and you just have it in an scalable system and so on. But it's still part of the same continuum that enables you to, to essentially make choices depending on, on what you do. But, but yeah, this is the power. And, and for me, it's again, the point of really being able to couple it with things like the AI for Earth grants and the ability to provide the experts that really really helps people to actually go and do things that otherwise are complicated. Well, that's fantastic. And the openness certainly is something that appeals uh, to the climate community. Um, question just popped up in, in chat, actually, that was an interesting one from, from Marcus. Um, you, you made the argument about, you know, kind of beating Moore, Moore's law, if you like, mm -hmm. with, with um, machine learning. But at some point, that also relies on Moore's law, or certainly, you know, a large part of the computational mm -hmm. improvements mm -hmm. in machine learning does. Um, why, 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 what makes you confident that ML can, can beat these kind of scalings? Well, so, so one, one part is, of course, because you start using things like GPUs instead of CPUs, which is a, a slightly kind of it gives you a better handling in terms of being able to do with, with machine learning. So in that sense, you have a, a better scalability there. But it's, it's true that you have to, to still consider other issues, like, for example, the energy consumption. And, and that's something that, that is, is very kind of front of mind at, at Microsoft as well, on how do you kind of minimize the, the emissions themselves from AI. And, and AI is going to have a huge use of computing resources. How, how do you make sure that that's not necessarily just having a, a bad impact? And, and that's why we are doing things like bringing all of the data centers using renewable energy by 2025. But yeah, it opens a lot of really interesting questions that, again, one has to step back a little bit and look at them as, as the whole picture and not just, just simply say one technology is perfect and the other is bad. I, I really see this as something that is going to continue as a, as a dialogue. And, and this is why I like this, this term of fermentation, because I think we are going to see a a really interesting situation in which HPC and simulation is going to coexist with machine learning. And we are going to find that for some things, 
one is fantastic and for others the other is, is very good and and I definitely don't look at machine learning as a way of discovering the laws of physics and in many ways we, we have already discovered those and they are beautiful but there are a lot of things that are difficult to do that machine learning can really provide us with with avenues to do them yeah I like your point about you know it will take time to learn learn these things and learn about how to do them well and where which aspects it will work well for um I'd like to end with a fairly open question from, from Edward here. So uh, he asks if you've, you know, you talked about neural networks and causal networks, but are there any other branches of AI that, that show great promise? Um, you know, what, what else are you excited about, I guess? Um, and what is the potential limitation of the technology? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, guess, I guess just because I have been very involved in these in this papers with the degenerative models and the, and the causality, I'm, I'm definitely very excited about those, those two areas, which I, I have happened to have the, the luck to work with really good people in, in them. But I mean, there are a lot of interesting things that are, are happening. I'm still fascinated how pretty much the first thing that people try is a random forest and how well it does for quite a lot of things. And, 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 and it tells you, tells you something. So I, I think it's a really wide space and, and the best thing is actually just to get your hands dirty and, and just play with it and, and help this experimentation and, and to do it in a very open way as well. I would definitely encourage people as well to publish or publicize the failures because mm. this is the other thing. There is also a lot of failures and a lot of a steep learning curve and a lot of things that go wrong and, and you all only hear about the successes and, and I, I would really like to encourage people just to also publicize all of the things that go wrong because that's, that's the point. We are really in the fermentation, in the experimentation phase. So just let's not decide, let's, let's learn from each other about the things that go wrong and that will make more plausible and more, more easy to, to get the right things working. That's a very good point. Thank you. Fantastic. I think this is a good point to wrap things up. So, and to thank Alberto again for a really fascinating talk, which he managed wonderfully despite being in childcare in parallel, which is always appreciated. Um, just for those of you uh, who followed the series, we, we're not done yet. We're going to winter break now, but we will continue. Actually, Alberto nicely introduced already our next speaker, which will be Suman Ravuri from DeepMind that worked with Alberto on, on some of the now casting problems as well. And this is on 5th of January, purely data-driven approaches to weather prediction, promise and perils. So the tension is there over Christmas, uh, get ready. And we start again on the 5th of January and go into early next year. So thanks a lot again, Alberto. This was a really great session. Thank you. And a hand back to Bastian, I should say at this point. Thank you, Philip. And a big thanks also to our speaker, Alberto arribas Uh We're curious to see if you are participants would uh, enjoy the webinar and we are launching a quick poll for you to let us know. In the meantime, let me mention a few things that may be of interest to you. So tomorrow at 8 a.m. we have a webinar on standardizing, standardization, ensuring trustworthy digital society enabled by AI technology, part one of a two-part series, which features, including other speakers, the director of the ITU Telecommunication Standardization Bureau, Director Chase Lee. Tomorrow, also at 3 p.m. European time, we have a session also on Trustworthy AI, part of the Trustworthy AI series, Algorithmic Recourse from Theory to Practice by Isabel Valera, Professor of Computer Science at the Saarland University in Germany. And then, as already mentioned, uh, the next installment in our AI and Climate Science series is on the 5th of January at 5 p.m., Purely Data-Driven Approaches to Weather Prediction, Promise and Perils by Suman Ravuri of DeepMind. You can find the links to all of these seminars in the chat. Please register and join us there. Uh, we also have a link to the AI for Good website. Have a look, there are many more webinars coming up. And with that, I'd like to once again, thank everyone involved. First, our host, Philip Steer, Duncan Watson Paris, uh, our speaker today, Alberto. Uh, you, our participants, our partners, sponsors, and our co convener Switzerland. And we hope to see you soon.
Rewind selector. 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 